hear anything. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, I have to wake you up. It's the, almost the last session. So, welcome everybody. Let me switch to the big screen. Yeah, you are. So, welcome to this talk about Lean Startup. Uh, I'm really glad to be here. But before we start, I just want to know a little bit about you people. So, in the room, by show of hands, how many of you are not developers? Okay, that's what I thought, so we're, oh, a couple of, over there. Okay, how many of you thought of creating your own startup one day? Okay, you're in the right room, that's cool. Almost, yeah, 75%. Uh, how many of you and went through and did create a startup? Uh, quite a few, about a 10, something like that. Okay, how many of you are still working in your own startup? Okay, you haven't tried too hard. Uh, and how many of you are working in a startup right now, even though it's not something you created yourself? Okay, about 10 or 15. How many of you are already familiar with Lean Startup? Okay, I, I hope I won't bore you too much. And how many of you have already fed up of me saying the word startup already? <laughs> okay, you're gonna hear that a lot, I'm sorry. A few words about myself. Um, I'm a, I've been a Java developer for about 10 years now. iOS developer for five years. I really love Agile methodologies, Scrum, Kanban, you name it. Uh, I've been a freelancer for five years and actually practicing Lean Startup methodology and techniques for about four years or so. It all started with Codesk, uh, just a little bit of story in 2011. Participated in the first Startup Weekend in Brussels, the very first one. Uh, actually, not really willingly, a friend of mine pushed me, said, yeah, we should have fun. Okay, 54 hours, what can you do in 54 hours? For those who don't know, a Startup Weekend starts on Friday night, ends on Sunday night, and you're supposed to create a startup in two days. Of course, because why not? So uh, I went there not really knowing what I wanted to do. Just a couple of days before, I said, uh, all these side projects that I already have, they're too complex for two days, so I'm just going to come up with a, a stupid idea. And I did, and uh, I pitched it, and it worked. We gathered a team. After two days, I thought, OK, we're going to pitch it, and then I'm going to go home and sleep for a week. Uh, and actually, yeah, it worked. We went. We won the, the startup weekend, and uh, so that's the first thing that came out of that. The second thing is that it was my first contact with lean startup uh, techniques, and uh, it really woke me up. So I hope it will do the same to you, even though we only have one hour and not 54. Uh, I've been a startup coach also for NestUp, so with all those experiences with lean startup and so on, uh, I co-created the NestUp startup accelerator acceleration program in uh, near Louvain-la-Neuve, in brabant Wallon, And uh, I've, I've coached a couple of startups uh, in that program, including the one where I'm currently working now, even if it was two and a half years ago. So I'm now VP of Engineering for Take It Easy, the fastest growing startup in Belgium. My team is over there, special kudos. And uh, by the way, guys, we are hiring, so if you're looking for great new opportunities, please come to me at the end. So, why would you create your own startup? I think that's the first question that we should ask ourselves. First reason that I hear a lot, it's cool to be an entrepreneur, right? I mean, it's good for the ladies. There's some money to be made, obviously. You're reading Y Combinator, I mean, uh, Hacker News and all those uh, TechCrunch sites all the time. And you get to use all these cool words like MVP, pivoting, that's nice. Angels, you know, magic guys. Anyway, so that's cool, right? Well, truth is, it looks a little more like that. <laughs> you get all the sleepless nights, the nightmares, not thinking about anything else, actually feeling guilty when you do anything else. This is an interesting experience. Another reason why you, want, you might want to do it is because you have this unique million-dollar idea that you might want to protect with an NDA. That's the lean version of an NDA, by the way. Thank you, David. Uh, so, 
yeah, it's unique, you want to keep it secret, and you're afraid that if somebody with more financial means steals your idea, they're going to do it instead of you. And, well, I'm here to tell you something really cruel, really rude. There is no such thing as a million dollar idea. Uh, if an idea is original, chances are it's either a bad idea or it's ahead of its time and by a lot. So might not be really a good idea. And if it's a good idea, most chances are somebody already had it and a lot of people are already working on it. So yeah, good original ideas, forget about it. You have plenty to lose, actually, not to talk about your ideas. Uh, that's something I always try to explain to people who come to me trying to pitch an idea, but getting me to sign an NDA first. Uh, yeah, that's not the, the, best, uh, the best way to get some good feedback. So, Another reason why you want, might want to create your own startup, you want to be your own boss. You read all the biographies of this guy, you think, yeah, I want to yell at people too. I want to get them to do my bidding instead of the other way. Well, and of course, your creativity will do the rest. I mean, managing a team cannot be that hard, right? You already manage projects. Well, truth is, like the wise man said, power comes with responsibility. Managing people is really, really hard. It's not just managing a project. And you, you can, especially when you found, when you create your own startup, I can tell you, you can feel the pressure from all sides, not just from the inside, but also, also from the outside. So it's a really tough job. Another reason, your product will be so much better, right? I mean, you've seen so many crappy, uh, I, I call them golfware products, because they're signed on golf courses and not with the real people anyway. And uh, yeah, of course, your user interface design will be so much better. You have all these ideas for these cool features that you're going to put in there. And of course, the more features, the more people will want to pay for it, right? Mm. If you're an agile developer, you know that's not true. So the cool, the, the really important thing here is not to think just in terms of, uh, of product, but also in terms of business model, OK? Yeah, I've done that a couple of times this week. Uh, so yeah, think in terms of business model and uh, try to be creative in terms of, how, of how, the, how you make money instead of just the product. And that's where the real innovation comes from. Sorry, I was late by a slide. Another reason you heard somebody tell you that they have a problem. Uh, by the way, this is a bad joke. It's just because in French there is this expression of téléphone arabe, the Arab phone. And this is a no. is a friend of mine, so I'm allowed. Anyway, now if it's just if you just heard of some rumors of some special population that's far away from you that had some problems and you know how to solve it, might not be this, the best option because you don't. Sorry, you don't know anything about the existing solutions to that problem. You don't know anything that specific business. And it's not your own problem. So in terms of motivation, in terms of yeah, keeping, keeping it going on a long term, it's really a, a tough job. So usually, the advice we try to give is try to scratch your own itch, uh, solve your own problems. You will see there are plenty of advantages. And, uh, and you really want to solve it, and it, it, it's something that you wake up at night thinking about, so that's a good thing. Another reason, and I think this will talk to you a little more. Are you tired of being a consultant? You think you sell your soul, you do things that you're not proud of and you don't do willingly, you go back home every night feeling dirty? Well. Anyway, if that's your case, you might think that you've, you're being exploited. Well, just one word of warning, beware of the pimps, OK? Uh, I don't, by the way, who was already there on uh, Tuesday afternoon for the university talk? Because I'm doing the same jokes all over again, so anyway, sorry. So beware of the pimps. Uh, they are not the same, but sometimes investors have different agendas, they have different objectives, and they might not be that well aligned with yours. So it's, a, it's also another kind of pressure. Another reason, you might already be obsessed about building a product, building it right with the right materials, the right technology, the right tools, 
of course. Well, and you, yeah, you want to do something cool, something really beautiful. The problem is, in a startup, your products sometimes look like that. And this is version two, by the way, with a roof and something to do the push ups and so on. Yeah, because reality catches on and you, have, you, you don't have the same, uh, the right budget from the start. You uh, can do it right from the get go. Um, and yeah, it just needs to, to last long enough until maybe the next round of funding or the next uh, big milestone in your business. So if that's what you want to do, I mean the previous one, if that's what you want to do, I'm just telling you, a startup is a very specific kind of business. It's a, it's a fast growing business and it has all sorts of uh, side effects. If you are passionate about building products, maybe a startup uh, model is not the most adapted. You can build a lifestyle business uh, out of a software product and still be very happy about it. It's just that you won't grow 10 times every year. Another reason, you've got the skills, right? You know how to code, you can fire up your IntelliJ uh, environment tomorrow and start coding and boom, in a matter of days, sorry, weeks, sorry, months, you have a product, right? Well, after all, the main part of a tech startup is the tech. Well, that's not the only one. Usually, entrepreneur, uh, investors are really, really interested at teams that have more than one founder first. The, I mean, mono-founder startups are really rare. I think there's Dropbox in, uh, in the uh, well-known examples. The guy was a, was, is a well-known developer. But apart from that, they usually prefer to have more than one, and especially those three very complementary profiles that are really hard to find in one person, the tech guy, the design guy, and the sales guy. Okay, So it might be a good idea to surround yourself to find some co-founders or to learn real fast. Another reason you might want to use your favorite technologies and build this cool cockpit that you've always dreamt of. And yeah, you want to learn about them on a real project. You've always been frustrated that your customer, your employer didn't want them to use, didn't want you to use them. And you have this idea of a really cool des design. Just a little story about that. This is, a, well, it used to be a shiny new building in the engineering school where I was in France uh, 10 years ago. And, uh, and the, they were really proud of it. I mean, they had it designed by a uh, boat uh, architect. And, uh, and the boat architect designed this cool building, thinking, OK, there's going to be a brand new campus. There's going to be this building there, this other building here. And it turns out that the other buildings didn't get the budget. So this one was right in the middle of a ground that was going in all directions, and the boat started to sink. And you could really, literally, find buckets of waters in the, in the hallways because the ceiling was flooding. So that's just an illustration of overkill design, and uh, it's really important to think about that to be pragmatic. How many of you have at least one pet project? side projects in the room. Yeah, usually they are the, the same ones as those who want to create a startup. That's a good sign. Anyway, so you have those projects on the side. You never finish them. Sometimes you lose motivation. You switch to something else, brand new technology, brand new idea, whatever. You have several of those. And you really want to turn at least one of them into a real business and move forward with it. Well, don't forget that you will have to stick with it. That means that at some point, if you create a startup, you will have to make choices to say no to all these other shiny new things that you would like to try. And this is tough, believe me, I've been there. Another reason you might want to improve everyone's life. I mean, who doesn't want to end wars and make the world a happy place? Well, when you think about it, the Facebooks of this world have changed everyone's life, and this is a cool idea to think in those terms. You want to heal the world and poverty, whatever. Well, the truth is, all these world-changing startups that affect pretty much everyone on Earth, they all started with a niche. They all started with a very small community, 
in which they could validate some ideas, some hypotheses, and, and then grew from there. And most of the time, they didn't even know what the ultimate model would be. So it's also interesting to think about. I mean, Facebook was only targeted at frustrated Harvard students, male ones first. Uh, Airbnb was just for uh, conference attendees in San Francisco, very small niche. And they only grew from there. Another reason market research shows you the way. There's money to be made there. And of course, you're the first one to read this Gartner report, right? It's so expensive, nobody can afford that anyway. So chances are there are plenty of other people who have already read that market research. And uh, you always have to ask, OK, who commandeered uh, this, stu this study, uh, what this, the sample looked like? It's always very, very uh, tricky to use those figures. So don't forget that in terms of market research and so on, quality trumps quantity, especially when you're exploring new markets and not just you know, trying to see, okay, uh, there's, uh, is it a good place there to start, to, to start my uh, fast food restaurant or something? No, it's more than that. If you want to explore new markets, quality trumps quantity. So, a couple of good reasons to do it. You want to invest in yourself. That's a good way. And it's really an investment because I can tell you, creating your own startup will eat some of your own money. And probably some of your families and friends as well, if you want to go that way. And a lot of startups have to. So, of course, it costs some money, it costs some time, but it's a unique investment in yourself. And whatever happens, even if it fails, then you will have learned a lot. And that's a good thing. And not just technically, I mean, people management, business management, there are a lot of things to learn. Another good reason you might be obsessed to find your own solutions, and I really, see, I really emphasize find, because it's not just, okay, I already have some solution uh, ideas that I want to put forward. No, it's really looking for one, searching, asking people around, trying to find a solution. For you, the process has to be more important than the end because otherwise you will always cut short and you will have surprises. Another good reason, you have unique opportunity and unique expertise that place you in a really, really good position to solve a particular kind of problems. Okay? If you don't have that, it's a bad sign for you. I mean, that's what makes you unique and that's what we call the founder market fit somehow. It's just to make sure that you uh, are the right person to do it. If you want to grow as a human being, that's also a very good reason, because I can tell you that creating a startup, whatever happens, is a, is a really a, a, an initiatic path. You learn a lot about yourself, about your limits. You push the boundaries of what you think you can do, and uh, it really makes you move forward in life much faster. And of course, you're tired of hearing people complaining, and you're not like that. You want to be a part of the solution. You want to propose your own solution. It's a matter of pride for yourself, and that's a good thing. Last but not least, you might have met some interesting people over the years, some people you like to work with, you trust deeply, and you want to, to work with them instead of being sort of, sort of imposed, the guys that uh, that your employer wants you to work with or something like that. And this, uh, a startup is a good way to do that because, I mean, the team is really much more important than the idea. And if the team is already solid and the people trust each other and they have automatic ways of communicating, of collaborating, it's always a good thing. Okay, so a few reasons why you would not do it. I think the most famous and the one that I hear the most is the golden cage excuse. I already have my company car. I already have my uh, life insurance, my gas card, my... I mean, I already have all, those, all this comfort, and this is really hard to quit. And you're right, it is. And that's why they give it to you. Like, you stick there as long as possible. I mean, you're not paid an incredible amount, but you have all these little advantages for you and your family that are really, really attractive. 
And in startups, you have all sorts of other perks, like, for example, stock options that are very rare in big companies. But those are really hard to value because it's just a bet on the future. Uh, and of course, you get to uh, learn a lot of stuff and you get to meet a lot of interesting people and so on. But once again, you cannot uh, pay your bills with business cards, so it doesn't really work. And after all, your comfort zone is comfortable. So that's an interesting reason not to hide under the carpet. It's real. Another reason that would hold you back is you don't have enough money set aside. As I said, creating a startup, uh, before you can even uh, raise any funding, uh, costs a lot of your own money. And if you don't have what they call bootstrap money, which is enough money to go to the first round of funding, uh, or to the first, I mean, revenues that can sustain your activity, then, yeah, you need some money to buy you a few weeks, a few months. Well, we'll see that it's a little less complicated than it used to be. Uh, actually, it has never cost less to create a startup than now, with all the AWS hosting and all the um, software as a service uh, products that you can find online, and it can really help you uh, at the beginning. And actually having too much money on the, on the side is kind of a devil in disguise, because having very few money forces you to be creative, forces you to be lean, forces you to be efficient, and yeah, that's also something to consider. Maybe you think you miss some business skills, and I won't tell you otherwise, business skills are important. Two things to consider. One, being a developer and learning business, if that's what you're interested in, is actually easier than the other way around. It's not to say that business skills are easier, it's just that the learning curve is shorter, and then the rest is experience, of course. The other thing is, if you're not interested in learning business skills, of course you can surround yourself. Of course you, you, you are in a better position, position if you have a co-founder that has those business skills, even big plus if you can trust him. Of course, you need to pay the bills, and, of, and as I said, uh, shares in a startup are not, a, are not an easy way to pay your rent. So you need more than that, and you need at least a little bit amount of, little amount of money to pay for just your food and shelter. And if you have a family, if you have some kids, it's even more responsibilities that are on you, and it's really uh, scary to, to cut back on, uh, on a regular salary for that. Maybe you don't have enough time. And once again, yes, indeed, creating a startup takes time. An interesting fact is that usually I hear a lot of people saying, okay, today I do it on nights and weekends. Once I quit my job to create my startup full time, I have more leisure time in nights and weekends. Eh, doesn't work that way. So if you don't have enough time now, don't expect to have more time tomorrow for yourself. I don't know what's the average age in the room, but sometimes people think, okay, this is not for me. I'm too old for this shit. It's just for students, 20-somethings, uh, college dropouts. They have the idealism, they have the unconscious to do it. And, uh, and yeah, it's just for them, not for me. Well, the truth is, when you are a little more than 20-something, you also have experience. You also have a big address book. You also have real-world uh, uh, knowledge of how the world works and how people interact and all, and all that. And this is really important as well. So don't let yourself down because you just think that uh, this is for youngsters. Your ideas are not good enough. As I said, and I will repeat it several times during this presentation, ideas are worthless. Okay, so forget about this million I dollar idea myth that's still going around even after the dot-com bubble and all that's happened over the years. It's wrong. Don't focus too much on the idea. I'll show you why later. Another reason you are in Belgium, I mean, how many Belgian people do we have in the room? Yeah, quite a few. Maybe you are in France, I don't know. Well, 
we all think that, of course, the mecca for uh, entrepreneurs, especially, I mean, software entrepreneurs, is the Silicon Valley, right? And I've been there a couple of times. It's true, it's really amazing. But it has some drawbacks as well. When you have all this money available, once again, it's really hard to be creative and to think of real problems. Also, those are first world problems, okay? So chances are, it, if you find something that works, it might only work in the Silicon Valley or in very specific uh, populations. And in the Silicon Valley, it's even worse than that because you have this re resonance effect of all those people working on uh, photo sharing and all that. And you all think that you, since you're doing the same thing, it must be right, the good idea, right? Well, of course, it's not something that you will find here in Europe, in Belgium, in France, whatever. Probably the reason I hear the most uh, that's holding people back from creating their own startup is what happens if I fail. And this is a key element in our culture. This is something that's really hard to change. I always say that, okay, of course you have more, more money in the Silicon Valley, but that's not the primary reason why uh, it seems easier to start there than, it, than here. It's because people are just less scared of failing. And actually failure is valued. It doesn't mean that you have to aim for failure, but yeah, fail fast, fail often, fail small, learn out of it, and you will see that it's very, uh, it has some high value. Now, of course, here you have all these uh, worries about, okay, well, will I, what will I write on my resume between okay, 2012 and 2014, I was creating my startup, but now there's a blank here. I don't want to talk about it. I'm not, I'm not proud of it. Don't be, don't be scared of that. This has some value, and more and more people understand it. So, you're software, software developers, right? So, why I think you are uniquely positioned to create your own startup. First, you've got the power, sorry, oops, you've got the power to execute, okay? This is really key. As I said, ideas are worthless, yet another one, and the reason for that is because execution is what matters. Execution is, of course, how you implement your idea. It's not just about the technical aspects, but also the strategy, the product, vision, and all that. And when you are a software developer, you already know a lot about that. And this is really hard to find. This is really hard to reproduce. This is really hard to copy. So you are in a very good position either to create your own startup or to join an existing startup, because of course there are plenty of uh, interesting startups out there who are looking for this kind of profile. That's good for you. Another thing, how many of you have already worked with Scrum or Agile methodologies? That's what I thought, a lot. And this will help you a great deal with startups, of course with lean startup, because it's inspired by the same principles and the same philosophy, but not just that, just because of the philosophy behind it that forces you to be, uh, to be, to be efficient, to be lean, okay? to avoid waste, to eliminate waste. That's good for you. Usually as software developers, you are surrounded by problems. You see them all over the place. Okay? You are in the center of them, and you are in the habit of putting them off. And that's also something that you will do a lot in startups, believe me. Of course, you, we all want not, not to create them, not to light those fires, but sometimes hard to avoid. One of the reasons I, I mean, one of the yeah, reasons why it's really interesting as a software developer is contrary, contrary to this guy, you can go back. If it doesn't work, if something fails, if for some reason you run out of money, either your own or somebody else's, well, you can always go back to freelancing and fill up the tanks again, okay? I've done that a couple of times, actually, and it works really well. And that's not something that, I don't know, a sales guy or a project manager or even a designer uh, has an easy time doing. So that works for you. So. Enough about the reasons, but about the psychology behind creating a startup. Let's move on to the real deal. That is how to create a startup. 
And the way I wanted to do it is just to show you the, uh, the usual way to create a startup, the, the one that comes to mind, and actually the one that was holding me back uh, five years ago when I wanted to create my first startup, and the position with what Lean Startup suggests. And that really works. So traditionally, you might think that the first step is to study the market, right? To know if there is put some potential for the idea that you have, especially in a, special, in a specific population or in a specific place. So you start designing some questionnaires, give out surveys, maybe uh, uh, interrupt people in the street, like, do you have some time to answer a few questions? And then people know, I'm always busy. Yeah. I mean, admit it, you always do that, right? We always have something more important to say than to do than to answer surveys. So, another source of information is surveys that other people have already done, market studies, market reports. Okay, but they're usually very expensive, and they are not updated that often because they cost a lot of money to make. And the problem with all those approaches is that. Your approach is quantitative only, which is good when you're trying to validate, again, an existing business model, uh, and you just want to validate some uh, strong knowledge that you already have, just to reassure yourself and your banker and your accountant that, yeah, it, it makes total sense. But when you're exploring new markets, when you're exploring a new business idea and you don't know yet what's going to work, this is a really poor approach. And as I said, all those approaches take time and money. They're only valid if you want to validate a strong hypothesis. And the problem with the fact that they take time and money is that the iteration cycle is very long. Designing a questionnaire, putting out the, the, uh, the survey, treating the results, uh, creating some nice pie charts and diagrams and graphs, this takes from a few months, yeah, usually a few weeks to a few months, at least. And if you learn that you're completely off the road on some aspects, then you have to restudy and redo the surveys. It takes an awful lot of, an awful, a lot of time. And usually, the problem with those surveys, especially when you design them yourself, you tend to try to confirm what you think you already know. So you, you ask the questions in just the right way, to validate what you already think. So can you really trust those figures? The way we avoid all those pitfalls in Lean Startup is by doing customer interviews. I mean, that's one of the main techniques anyway. One of those that works the best, and also one of those that is the hardest to implement for us software developers. Because uh, without making a general rule, Usually we're introverts, we don't like to... You prefer talking to machines than to people, right? Admit it. Okay, anyway. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's really, it, it's, it's much harder for, uh, for us to interview people, but believe me, it's just a, um, yeah, a habit to get into, and once you're there, it's much easier. So how do you do that? Well, first, good idea is to brainstorm all the possible customer segments, okay? That's the first thing to find, customers. Forget about your shiny new ideas, put it on a shelf, maybe you will get to use it later. Focus on the customers first. Okay, so brainstorm all the possible customer segments, and the segments word here is really, really important. Your customer segment is not the world, Earth. No, it's, it's gotta be more specific than that, especially when you start. You gotta start with a, a community that, is, that gives you some valuable feedback, that give you, gives you some qualitative feedback. That's the most important thing that you're looking for. So once you've brainstormed all the possible uh, customer segments, just choose three. Based on your gut feeling, that's the moment where you get to practice your instincts. You gotta start somewhere, okay? It's really important in Lean Startup, it's, a, it's a, essentially a scientific, very, uh, very experimental method. And in any experimentation, it's really dangerous to mix the experiments, because then treating the results and, and, and understanding what works and what doesn't is really, really hard. 
So try to separate things, start somewhere, so why not choose three uh, with your guts. We'll talk more in details afterwards about what a business canvas is, but basically that's just a short version of your business plan, okay? And it's really important to, uh, for those three first customer segments that you've chosen, to try and think in terms of, okay, who are these people? What are their problems? What are, their what are the solutions that I could propose to them? How can I make money with them? This is really important, okay? So that's the third step in the, in the generic process. Of course, this is not to take by the letter, it's just a generic process that you can keep in mind. Another thing that's important, don't think too much in terms of market size. Try to sort those three options by pain level first. Market size comes at the end, okay? So usually the best order is pain level, ease of reach, the price that they're ready to pay for a solution to you, to the problem, and the market size only at the end. Usually when I, when I need to do that, I just uh, take out my Excel sheet, yay, Excel again, and uh, draft a quick ma matrix, add some weights here and there, give a score to, every, uh, to each of the three targets, and then I get to choose the first one that I'm gonna work with. Okay? It's not very scientific, but uh, it's just a start. So take the first one, and list your hypothesis, okay? At this stage, you want to list, especially the hypothesis related to who the customer is, okay? What's, our, what's their habits, what's uh, who they are, what they do, and, and the other thing is what their problems are, okay? At this stage, this is all that matters, customer and problem. No, no need to go further than that. And that's where the hard part comes in, because all that was just you, with your co-founders in a room, on a whiteboard, very nice. Now you get to get out of the building and meet real people. This is really important. Try to focus on people, of course, who correspond to the market, the customer, the customer segment that you have identified, and ask real questions. For all the uh, customer segment validation questions, you can ask some straightforward questions like, okay, how old are you? What do you do in life? Do you have kids? All those criteria can be really fast and easy to validate. For all the questions about problems, okay, validating problems, these need to be open-end questions. No, uh, I'm sure you have this problem, right? No, what are your problems related to blah, blah, blah. And then you listen. The listening part is really important. And when I say listen, it's not just in your, with your ears, it's also with your eyes. Look at the non-verbal aspects. This is really important. Once you've done that with 10 people, that's a rule of thumb, but it's a good number to avoid, you know, uh, errors, specific errors. And, uh, and at the same time, it's more efficient that way. But that's the moment when you adapt, you change a few things, you pivot, that's it, we said the P word. Knowing that pivoting doesn't mean changing everything. We hear that a lot, okay? Yeah, yesterday I was doing a, a, um, a website for, uh, to put in touch uh, people with dogs, with uh, uh, old ladies, and today I'm selling refrigerators. This is not a pivot, okay? This is the, be the best way to spin around and get dizzy. This is not what you do. So usually a pivot is, okay, I thought that this customer had this problem, I'm gonna stay with this customer, but I'm gonna pivot on the problem, okay? This is the kind of thing that you, and you go again, until you get a good understanding of you, who your customer is, and you've got a real problem, okay? This is really important. So, in a traditional uh, method, in traditional way of creating a business, after you get your market study and you get your research and your numbers and so on, the next step usually is the infamous business plan, right? Usually 50, 100 page, document with plenty of figures and big plans on three years, we're gonna do that, we're gonna take over the world. Well, it takes time to write, again. So, if it takes time to write, it has a long iteration cycle, so if you want to update it, if you want to change it, and believe me, everything will change. That's a startup we're talking about. So, yeah, it's very cumbersome to update. Usually it's something that you write once, you put it on a shelf, and it stays there 
Or you, maybe you put it in your toilet so that you can read it when you're bored. I don't know. But that's pretty much it. And besides, who will read it? I mean, that must ring a bell to all the guys doing Agile because they were frustrated by Waterfall, right? It's like useless documentation. That's just a waste, okay? And the truth is, very few investors actually read those business plans. They just want to know that you've done it. And they read the introduction, the conclusion, and say, okay, that's nice. And usually it goes to the bin right after that. And yeah, usually in those documents, you include some three-year projections to really reassure the investors and show that kind of growth, okay? And of course, there's nothing, nothing can go wrong at the bottom part of the, of the curve, right? No way to go down. And of course, investors have seen that tens, hundreds of times. They know about that. You won't bullshit them like that. It won't work. So, alternative to this business plan technique, in the Lean Startup, we prefer to use this. This, I mean, again, just to make a parallel with what you might already know with uh, Agile methodologies, is not much more than an information radiator, okay? This is a board. You're uh, encouraged to display it somewhere visible. You've guessed it, you will get to use all those 3M squares again. Post-it notes, yay! With plenty of colors and so, and so on. And the, this kind of canvas really sums up all the different aspects of a business plan, basically, of a business model, but in a much more digestible and much more efficient way. And of course, also much more easy to update, and that's the key. Okay, so we're gonna go quickly over all of these uh, boxes because they are all very important, and they are also all important to take into account in a specific order, usually. By the way, this is a lean canvas, something, it's just one variant of this kind of exercise, uh, something coined by uh, Ash Moria. I really encourage you to go to uh, uh, by uh, Running Lean book, it's an excellent one, and he has a blog with plenty of advice. And this, for me, this is the, the canvas that is most adapted to the kind of products we're talking about here, software products. Okay, If you are creating a hardware startup, if you're creating a, a drug startup, for example, this is a completely different kind of business, and usually calls for different kind of tools to model the business model. So, what are the important parts of this canvas. The first one to focus on, as I said, is the customer segment part. By the way, this is really important. On the right, you get all the customer things. On the left, you get all the problem things. And in the middle, you have the solution. Customer, problem, solution, that's the key. Three things that you need to figure out. Okay? So, yeah, usually for customer segments, what we tend to try to do is use customer personas. It's just a way to think of things that are important in the customers that you think about. So give them a name, can be a good idea, uh, just to refer to uh, your customer easily. Think of the behaviors, okay? What does she do uh, all day? Uh, think of her typical day. Uh, when does she go to work? Uh, who does she have to care about? This is really important. Of course, try to focus on what's relevant for you, okay? Uh, but on the other hand, not, don't focus too much because otherwise you might miss some opportunities on the sidelines. So this is really important. What are our needs? What does she expect in life? Sorry. Okay, what are our goals? And a few facts, okay? Uh, how old is she? I mean, is, is, it, is it a she or a he? Uh, all those aspects can be important and can really give you some important information. Once again, think about specific customer segments. We're not talking about the world here. We're just trying to find the ideal little community that can get you started. And then, from then on, you will get to evolve that, to uh, broaden the, 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 the scope of your uh, customer segments, but start with something small and easy to reach. Once you have that, Try to think of the three most pressing problems for this specific population, okay? That's usually what differs the most from one population to the other. 
at first you might think that your customers is, I don't know, lawyers, for example, all the lawyers. And then you realize by doing the customer, uh, customer segmentation exercise that, well, actually there's, there can be some difference between uh, established lawyers and uh, just graduate lawyers, or between uh, independent ones and employees. I don't know, there can be plenty of things that differ. And usually it starts with the problems. If you think of different populations, chances are they will have different problems. Another interesting aspect in that reflection is the existing alternatives. Okay? Try to think of how those people solve their problems, those three problems, right now. It can be another software product, it can be a competitor of yours, or it can be just, I don't know, a stepmom, uh, a phone, uh, an email, a mailing list, a newsletter, whatever. It can be something very not software-like, even. So think of all the alternatives. Why is it important? For two reasons. First, it will help you to position yourself in terms of marketing. Okay, today you use an Excel file to do that. Tomorrow I will propose you a better solution. And also it helps you to position yourself in terms of pricing. Because if it takes them three hours to do it, and you make them pay, I don't know, 10 euros to do the same thing, but in five minutes, then you get something going. Okay. Third aspect in order is the unique value proposition. One way to put it is just, this is the first sentence that appears in big letters on your website, okay? The first day you want to sell it. This is the message that you want to go through. This is the, the sentence by which a person coming to your website will decide if it's for them or not. This is really hard to craft. This can take some time. Another way to think about it is the X for Y technique, or, okay, uh, this is very uh, trendy right now, the Ubers for something, you know, the Airbnbs for dogs and all that. There are plenty of those. It's, but once again, don't put that too much forward in your external communication. This is just a way for you to think about your business model and to uh, present it to some people so that they, they make the connection with something they already know. Next element, now that you have a unique value proposition, how will you implement this unique value proposition to solve the problems on the left? Okay. Usually, that's the moment when you start to think in terms of features. As few features as possible, just for the problems that you have identified and validated. Next element, the channels. By channels, I, ju I don't just mean marketing channels, but just how are you going to make people aware of your solution, how are you going to reach uh, out to them, how are you going to distribute, support your customers. These are some really interesting aspects because they will have an important impact on your cost structure. Then it's time to, st it's time to start thinking in terms of revenues. And this is where you can get creative too. Okay, don't think in terms of, okay, uh, like any other SaaS solution, I'm just gonna make my uh, users pay a, a monthly or a yearly subscription, or the freemium model, the magic word. No, no, there are some more creative ways to do business, okay? One example that I like is this idea that uh, a company can buy invoices from people who need uh, money now, and sell it to people who have some money to pay it later. I mean, this is what I call a creative business model. The, 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 the product itself is as easy as possible, but the, the business model is really creative and uh, it makes a lot of sense financially. Then, focus on your costs. Okay, make a difference between your fixed and your viable costs. Of course, the human cost is usually the biggest now. Uh, it used to be that the servers was a big concern. Now, not so much. So, uh, that's, think of all the costs that are incurred by all the, the boxes that you've already filled. And it might be time at this point to start thinking of how many customers you might need to offset your cost. How many of those I don't know, subscriptions or, or one-time payment on the right, you might need to, f to offset the cost on the left. This is a very easy way to see if your business model is somehow viable. 
Of course, any experiment needs a way to measure its success. You need real metrics. By metrics, I don't mean vanity metrics. Registered users is not going to get you anywhere, except all these registered users have to pay somehow. But if it's just yeah, people coming to my site, to my site and uh, adding a record in my database, that's not going to do you any good. Okay. So these are some real metrics that measure the success of your business model. Especially the really interesting aspect here is first the, all the marketing metrics. So I really encourage you to Google pirate metrics. There are some good uh, element of uh, uh, inspiration in there. And also what I call the problem metrics. So people have problems. Either they spend too much time or they spend too much money or they spend uh, too much energy doing something. How can you measure that and the decrease in all that that, you, that your solution brings to the customers? And last but not least, probably the hardest uh, box to fill, especially at the beginning, it's the unfair advantage. And by unfair advantage, I mean something that, can be, that cannot be easily copied or bought. Okay? So maybe it's a patent, but usually software patents in Europe, not a thing. So maybe it's some unique expertise that you have, some market knowledge that you have, some unique network, industry uh, uh, knowledge. This is the kind of thing that you put there. Usually it takes time to build that sort of unfair advantage. So don't be too worried if you don't fill that, that box at first. Really important aspect about this, at the beginning, those are all assumption. All assumptions, okay? You know nothing, Jon Snow. So, start with that feeling. Humility, you don't know anything. So, all of that are just hypotheses that you need somehow to validate, to experiment. Next step, after you get your business plan slash business canvas, the prototype. That's what we are all, as software developers, that's what we are all eager to start working on, right? So you start guessing what people are going to need, because, come on, of course you know. Uh, you guess what they're familiar with, the kind of interface that they, interfaces that they already use. Of course, you include as many features as you possibly can in a given amount of time, even though you know that very few of those features will actually be used, right? Because you like to waste your time. A lot of wasted time and effort. An important thing with all that, with building your prototype, do not consider that as free effort. It's not because you can do it yourself. It's not because you are a developer and after all, well, it doesn't cost you a dime to do it. That it doesn't cost you a dime to do it. Because actually, that's an opportunity cost. The time that you spend building your prototype is time that you won't spend on something else. And by something else, I don't just mean another project, but I also mean another uh, aspect of your project. The business part, the marketing part, okay? the growth part, the fundraising part, which usually takes a lot of time. So this is not free effort. Try to value it, try to put a figure on that. This is really important. And then, of course, when you're building a prototype, when do you stop, right? Seems like there's always something that you can improve, some small features that you can tweak, some button that's not the right color. And it's funny because the more you go, the more you approach a stage where you can actually show something, the more details you find. It's like you're afraid to show it or something. I don't know. It's weird. We all do that. Instead of the prototype, what you should think of if you're doing lean startup is this. First of all, the most the minimum testable product, yeah, sorry about the most, it's a minimum testable product, should be, anyway. Uh, and then the minimum viable product, okay? What is the minimum thing that you can do to validate your assumptions? There are several techniques to do that. You can also go to interviews, same way as we validated the problem before, okay? Once you have your customer and problem, you can validate your solution with interviews, that's one way of doing it. You don't need to build any actual software. You can use wireframes. They're very, very powerful. Hard to sell, but still very powerful. You can use landing pages. They're very powerful, especially to validate this unique value proposition box in the middle. Okay? If you want to 
test out several sentences and we, uh, see which one brings you the most email addresses, that's a good way to do it. Another technique, the concierge mode. Even though you want to satisfy as many customers as possible, you might want to start with a small niche and with a method, with a product that's so simple that it's not scalable. The example I always give is just, okay, give out a phone number and do the service yourself just on the phone. Of course, you will only be able to serve like 10 or 15 customers that way, but it will bring you a lot of validated learning. Another technique is the Wizard of Oz. That's something that was famously used by uh, Zappos, for example, at the beginning. The way he sold shoes is just by putting a web page with some uh, pictures of uh, shoes that he had taken in shops. And then people would order online thinking that it would go through a, an entire logistics machine. Actually, it was the guy going to the shop, buying the shoes and sending them via the post. But he learned a lot with that. So that's a good technique as well. And think of all the ways that you can put something together very quickly. Forums, blogs, mailing lists, phone numbers, they are really powerful. AngelList, the famous uh, marketplace for investors and entrepreneurs, started that way with a mailing list. That's it. And thanks to that mailing list, they learned what was important to their users and they started to put those features into a real website. So think of ways to validate your hypothesis with a minimum of effort. Okay, next step, usually when you have a prototype, you start, okay, I'm gonna show it to people, but then they're gonna steal my idea and do it for me. No. Of course, the way you protect yourself from that is by writing a non-disclosure agreement because you're afraid that somebody will steal your idea. As I said, good and, idea, good and original ideas don't exist. Don't need to explain why again. And a good way to think about this is this. It comes from Derek Sivers, it's not mine, but you can look this up on the internet. And that's an important aspect. You have to multiply left by right. So that means that a weak idea with an awesome execution is worth about a million dollars. A brilliant idea with crappy execution or no execution, $20, that's it. Okay, so think about that. This is real, by the way. I mean, I, I haven't seen anybody who, in the industry who didn't agree with that. Instead of being afraid of talking about your idea, try to gather as much feedback as possible. That's the key. You have more to win by doing this than to lose, okay? You get feedback from real potential users who might become your potential first customers, from investors, from partners, of course from co-founders. And remember that if your idea is all you have, then you have nothing. This is really key. I think I've, I will have said enough that ideas are worthless anyway. Usually when you get that, you go to see investors and you want to pitch your business plan, okay? Just remember a few things. Angel investors are really interested in a few things. Quality, passion, commitment, integrity. Of course, you've got all that. No need to go over that. That's not a problem. Market opportunity and potential. You have your market study, right? You have your market report, so you're reassured with that. You have your business plan. You need initial traction. Usually that's the missing factor, and it's really important. Initial traction a way to show that your figures are real. They're not plain bullshit. If you have some technology, intellectual property, patents, anything, that can be good for you. But usually they don't, va they don't value NDAs that much anymore. And an appropriate valuation, this is also very important. So it means that they will be able to give you as few bucks as possible for maximum of shares in your company. That's the logic. So this is also something that you need to think about when you start talking to investors. And exit strategies, okay? Does your solution have a good chance of being sold, acquired, uh, go public, whatever? They want to make money, that's their primary goal. And of course, to do that, you need an elevator pitch. You need a pitch deck. You need all sorts of material to really uh, perfect your craft and, and show it to people and, and basically get out, uh, get visible and, uh, and cut through all the noise. The most important aspect, you need introductions. Okay? Those investors are so hard to reach, especially the best ones, 
So you need some people to show you the way. You need some people who can say, okay, I know this guy, he's onto something, you should meet him. This is really uh, valuable. The first thing that I think you should focus on if you want to show something to an investor these days is validated learning. Okay? If you come up with a way to show that you have a market and to prove it, to, v to show that you have validated your learning and not just uh, put some assumptions out there, this is a good way. And this is the loop that's at the heart of everything Lean Startup, okay? Build, learn, measure. Uh, build, measure, learn, sorry, in that order. Anyway. Just the last uh, resource that can be very useful, something that you could start to think of for your uh, next business that you're going to start on Monday, right? Uh, and that's the elevator pitch. This is one way to write it that has all the essential elements in it. So once again, these are just elements coming from the canvas, except the company name, but don't spend too much time on that. Find the code name and that will be fine. But defined offering, platforms are not defined offerings. Okay, website, mobile app, mailing list, phone number. These are good defined offerings. Uh, target customers, you know what it is. You want to solve a problem and your secret sauce is pretty much your unique value proposition. And that's all I have for today. I hope that it has some inspired some of you to get started and read some uh, interesting things about that. And we don't have any time for questions, I'm, I'm afraid. So if you have any questions, then please come see me. Thanks a lot.